Thank you. Okay. You know I'm not going to stay behind this podium, right? <laughs> I'm going to go on walkabout. So uh, for those of you who don't, first off, thanks for being here. And I, how can I follow that? That was awesome, right? I have this like fan crush here going on. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Lauren Simpson. By day, actually I teach at night, I'm a clinical, just newly made associate professor at the University of Houston Law Center. Go Cougs! <laughs> and I teach legal research and writing. We call it Lawyering Skills and Strategies, and it's an awesome gig and I love it. But outside of work, I am into wildscaping and conservation of pollinators and insects generally. So this is my passion outside of work. So this talk I've never given before, and what I would like you to do, like I do in my classes, this is participatory, and those who don't participate have to clean the erasers after class. <laughs> so get your cell phone ready. And uh, I'm gonna go quickly, so I've got a series of 10 tips and we'll get where we get in 15 minutes or so. Um, Barry, you're gonna tell me 10 minutes and then 15. I wanna have a little time for Q&A. So all of the photos that you're gonna see here, I have taken with my cell phone, every single one. And I've taken them crawling on my belly or hunched over in our front gardens, um, a few in the back, at St. Julian's Crossing, which is just a fancy name that we gave to our home gardens. So I'm in the Oak Forest area of Houston. I live in a house that's under 1,600 square feet. The front and backyards are comparable. And now probably about 60% of the front yard is converted into a more tailored looking, but nonetheless wildscape. I'm probably close to 76, 78% species are native at this point. So we're getting there. So one of the things that I like to do is to document the insects and the plants in our gardens because I like to share that on my educational community and to talk about it. So folks have asked me, how do you get clear pictures and how do you get macros with your cell phone? And I'm gonna tell you tonight a few tips. Okay, so before you photograph. So before you photograph, it's kind of like before you put pen to paper, metaphorically speaking these days, and this is what I tell my students at U of H that you want to think about the reader and the reason before you write. For whom am I writing? What will motivate them? And what is my ultimate goal? No different for any kind of photography with a cell phone or a, a real camera. So for example, and, and this will inform how I take the photographs, right? So if I'm doing it just for identification, like I'm trying to catalog the plants or insects in my garden for my own purposes, or I'm trying to do it for iNaturalist or Nature's Notebook, for example, as a citizen scientist, then it doesn't have to be the best looking photograph, but what I do have to do is record those parts of the animal or those parts of the plant that will help experts understand what it is and identify it. Right? So for a plant, you're going to look at how the leaf attaches to the stem, you're going to look at the uh, fluorescence at the top, but you're also going to get pictures that are a little bit further back. Does that make sense? If my goal is purely an aesthetic one, because I want this pretty thing on my desktop or framed in my house, or I'm going to put it up on Facebook or something, then that's a whole different matter. Okay? And then finally, maybe you want to use it for educational purposes. So let me tell you what you're going to see is informed by my goal. So my goal is um, to attract folks to, and to educate them through pretty pictures about the invertebrates, the insects, arachnids, things like that, that use the native plants. Because truly, as you know, native plants mean nothing if you don't think about community. It's all about the ecosystem with which it's evolved. So my goal is to show people the small, that's why I do a lot of macros, right? both the native plant and the insect using it so that they can see what can be in their own garden and it can motivate them and by gum these things are gorgeous okay so that's why i do that therefore because that is my goal i'm looking for the perfect picture i'm not necessarily looking for the one that will identify the body parts of the insect or the attachment of the leaves to the base of the plant you with me so you will see heavily a focus on the flowering part of the plant that's just, how, that's just how I do it, right? Um, and I feel free to enhance as well, to make it more visible, to increase the lighting. Why? I would not do that if I were uploading it for citizen science. 
because that could affect the identification. But I darn well want to do it if I want to make it look really pretty, okay? So that's not my photo, but there you go. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Come on, oops, okay. First tip, wait for it. So I got about a minute for each of these tips, y'all, so we're gonna go a little fast, like a Seinfeld episode, a fast talker. All right, each of these photographs is of an insect that moves quickly, right? And they're all, I think, except for the bottom left, that's a sphex wasp. I think it's a great golden digger wasp, I think. That's on um, a basil flower, but all the rest are on native flowers. Who knows what the upper left corner is? Frog Texas frog fruit. Oh my gosh, if that's not in your garden, it should be in your garden. What's over there on the upper right? Crow poison, right? Crow poison. Comes up in early spring and behind it a... Um, yeah, wood sorrel, right? Oxalis. And then down here? Blue bonnet, Texas blue bonnet. So that little, that little thing on the Texas blue bonnet, that's a fly. And it's just a couple of millimeters long. That's a female margin calligrapher. And in other news, I know that that's a female margin calligrapher. Hashtag bug nerd. But it took, it took a lot of waiting and patience to get these pictures. So sometimes I've even spent up to 30 minutes following an insect around. Now, if you're doing a plant, it's going to be faster. But if your goal is to show the interaction between plant and insect or plant and animal, just be prepared to spend a little time. Also be prepared to get down low and to hunch over. Does that make sense? And if you want to incorporate the wildlife that's using the native plant, then one of the things I found handy is to look for moments where the wildlife is distracted and won't notice you. Mating, sunning, feeding. Okay, and feeding is useful if you want the native plant to show how it's used. Does that make sense? Second, look for interesting color combinations. This is for any type of photography, but I think it, it works, it translates very well for the phone. So take a look for a moment at this color wheel. There are different color wheels. This one was copyright free, public domain. That's why we have it. So you notice that the purples or the violet is opposite on the color wheel from the yellows, right? Red is opposite of blue or actually green, and then blue is opposite of orangish, okay? So the first kind of color combination that I look for are what we call complementary colors. Those are colors that are opposite on the color wheel, red to green, orange to blue, purple to yellow, and around it. Notice in the center, that's um, seaside goldenrod and then aromatic aster, which is native to the hill country, here I have rough and Texas coneflower, and then purple coneflower, I had it in there before I knew it wasn't native. Um, here we have a common buckeye butterfly with the oranges in it, and then the purplish of the blue mist flower. Are you with me? So each of these has complementary color combinations, and why do those make good subjects? They make really good subjects because they, um, in our brain, they trigger interest and energy when you have those opposite opposite colors. If you want a more soothing palette, come on, then analogous colors, meaning those colors close on the color wheel. So in the front we have um, those two are not native, it's a standing wine cup and salvia, amelie blue sage, and then yellows, browns, and reds. So those have a soothing effect, and I learned this in um, Native Landscaping Certification Program Level 2. I was doing it intuitively, but I learned it in my class. I'm like, well, that's why it looks awesome. <laughs> and then sometimes you just want color combinations that are just darn pretty. That's a bee, by the way, in the, in the over corner over there. That's a standing wine cup, but it's the same as our native in size, um, Calirho and Balacrata, which is our, our uh, prostrate wine cup. It's gorgeous, right? So think about color when you photograph. Come on. Come on. Okay. Third tip. If, especially if you're photographing an insect or an animal on the native plant for whatever reason, then take a lot of pictures. I've been known to take up to 30 to 40 photographs of the same situation. So of all of these, you can see some are blurry. I've got the garden hose in the background, and it took me to get this one. It took me quite a number of photos, many more than the seven or six you see there. I can't count, um, sometimes 20, 30. It's okay because in the days of film, you didn't want to waste it, right? 
but not with digital. Likewise, the same for plants. You can see here uh, my Gara linderheimi, and it took multiple photographs until I came across the one that I really liked. So just take a lot of them. You can't go wrong. Four, if it will advance. OK, so get close and personal. So you know on our phones we can make it zoom, right? So if you hold up your phone, go ahead and engage it, and open up your camera. So on the iPhone, which is what I have, you can do this with your fingers, right? And zoom in and out. OK. So um, if you want a good macro photograph with a cell phone, don't think zoom first. Think get close to the subject matter. And when I say get close, even with bees and wasps, again, I catch them feeding, mating, sunning, when I'm not going to interfere with them. I get between one and five inches from the subject. Let me say that again, between one and five inches from the subject. If you get as close as an inch or two, you actually don't have to use the zoom. But if you're older like I am and you need glasses, then you may need to zoom it a little bit because otherwise you can't really see the features. I have a friend, uh, Missy Palmer Hawkins, who's in um, another part of Texas. She takes the most amazing photos and she shoots them blind. She doesn't zoom at all. She gets under them and gets butterflies in flight, bees in flight, amazing. I know, I don't have, she just has a knack for it. So get really, really close. You can use Zoom. If you don't use Zoom, you can crop afterwards and you will not lose the pixelation. You will not, you will not pixelate too much, meaning getting too blurry. So for the first time in the last few months, I've started either doing just the regular setting or maybe one and a half times or two times to Zoom it if I'm very, very close. Never, ever, ever use Zoom for big distances. Just don't because it'll come out very blurry. Understand that the more you use the zoom function, the less crisp the photograph is gonna be. Many of these were taken with magnification up to three to four times. So I would not go above four times, I'd probably stick it at two to three. But if you do, understand that the trade-off is when you expand it, especially in print form as opposed to like this, then you're gonna lose some of that sharpness. Does that make sense? But these were all taken in our gardens after a rainstorm. So let's practice the focusing hacks. All right, take some, this is the interactive part. Okay, take something small like a coin or a key out of your pocket, your purse, your wallet, your bag, and put it on your knee or your leg. And I'm gonna do that with, I don't have anything. I'm gonna do it with my ticket. I am not gonna do it with my ticket. I'm gonna do it with a business card here. Okay, so put it on your lap and open up your, your camera. Okay, so there are a couple little hacks for focusing. So look how close I am. Can you see here? I'm about an inch from this business card and I wanna focus on whatever it is. Okay, if you get really close to the object you put on your knee, you notice it's pretty blurry, right? So again, this is not zooming in, this is just plain. So I have choices. One technique is to tap in the center of the object that you want it to focus on. To me, that doesn't really work. For some people, it works great. For me, it doesn't. This is what works for me. I start in closely and slowly, look how slowly, I move it backwards until it captures a crisp image of what I want to focus on. You doing that? Look how high up I am now. I went from half an inch to about, what is that, a couple inches? And it's ready to focus. You with me? I find that that technique where you start very close and slowly move back is the better way to get it to focus on what you want it to focus on. Does that make sense? And a friend of mine who's an actual photographer told me, she goes, yeah, Lauren, that's a technique that works with real cameras as well. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that um, the same friend, her name is Teresa Domeno, and she's a professional photographer who's had her monarch uh, photography at the Houston Museum of Natural Science. She's amazing. She said, she said out loud something that I was kind of doing intuitively, and that is using that kind of focusing technique 
You want the thing that you want to focus on to be in focus. The best backdrop is one that's quiet or calm. In other words, it is out of focus, but the thing that's the subject you want to capture, plant or insect, is in focus. Notice that there's not a lot going on in the background here. Yes, with the Gulf fritillary in the upper right, there's some pink and green, but those colors are complementary with what you see in the butterfly. You with me? So the real focus is on the insect up front because my goal was to photograph the insect. And notice here, there's movement behind the bee on the left with the stems of the um, yellow wild indigo, right? But it's all in the same color family. And so the eye is naturally drawn to the yellow of the flower of the yellow wild indigo and the bee that's nectaring in it. And that is a pipevine swallowtail on um, um, Aristolochia tomentosa, which is our woolly Dutchman's. How am I doing on time? Got a couple minutes? Ish. You're kind. <laughs> we'll do one more and call it a day. And this is another example. So notice this leaf-footed bug. Which one can you see more clearly? Correct. So it's not just that you want a quiet background. This is kind of a riotous background. This is on southern arrowwood, one of our native shrubs. I love it. But I got a contrasting pale palette behind it because the subject is dark. And then finally, last one, feel free to enhance or to crop. So when you're crawling around in your belly getting these photographs, they're going to be all cattywampus. So this one is OK. It's a monarch on our um, uh, yeah, Cori Lanceleaf Coreopsis. Um, but I don't, it draws the eye in the wrong direction. It feels uncomfortable, and it's got a yellow tinge to it. It was just that time of day. So what I did was, on my phone, I pulled up the light, the um, cropping function, the color function. And the ones I use the most are brilliance or um, increasing the light. Sometimes I will also increase the dark or the contrast to make the background subdue. And then I will use the cast function and decrease the cast. So here there was a yellow cast. And this is the final product. What a difference, right? Now again, reader and reason, who's going to view it? Why am I doing it? I would not upload the one on the right to iNaturalist. The one on the left, I will, but not the one on the right. But gosh, that's pretty, isn't it? And I think we're going to call it a day because my time is up. Those are my key ones. Are we good? Can you flip through the other ones? You want me to flip through? OK, the next one. Please do not mistake, make the mistake I did. Archive your things and organize them as you go. And please, for the love of all that's good, back them up onto an external hard drive. <laughs> Once you lose photos, you never forget. <laughs> but mine are now just sitting in photo folders. Organize it. Um, I'm not going to worry about that. And always have your phone with you. I never, ever, 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 did I say ever, never, ever, ever go out in the garden without my cell phone. And by the way, why do I use my cell phone the most? I mean, I have an amazing um, Nikon DSLR. It's got a macro and kit lens. It's phenomenal. My husband just rolls his eyes because that was my Christmas gift two years ago. <laughs> but I'm not going to carry that around my neck when I'm gardening. This is what I have when I garden. I cannot tell you how many amazing things I would have missed if I didn't have it ready. And that, my friends, is it. Happy picture taking.